Well, good morning, church. It's great to be here with you. Some of you will remember me. I used to be a member. Um, very, very soon. I think this is my last official duty before I take up a new role as Associate Pastor of Byron Bay Church. And I want to thank Ulsterville Church for loaning me to the Byron community for the next little while. It's an exciting ministry and I have to give it a plug. Is that okay? Bryce, can I give it a plug? This week, every evening from around about 5.30 to 8, we will be having the most exquisite vegan delights and some lovely music courtesy of the Lismore Symphonic Orchestra who are sending over teams. Um, different themes each night. I think tomorrow night is strings and then there's a flute and harp and there, there may be some brass and a few things in there. But if you want to be a missionary this week, then you get in your car, drive to Byron, spend lots of money, give Bryce big tips and be there just in case the Holy Spirit might impress you to speak to somebody from the community who is in the um, vicinity of the cafe, and, um, and you can be a great missionary that way. Um, the cafe is going really well. Bryce and Janine and Jody and the team are doing a fantastic job, and the conference is, is investing strategically in the Byron community, sending up a young Bible worker who's never heard of shoes called Josh Newbegin to be the senior pastor there next year, and I, as the old dog, will be his wingman. So we're looking forward to a, to a great ministry next year at Byron Bay. So please pray for us. I do not consider myself to have moved churches just stretching the horizon. So um, before we begin um, our sermon today, I'd invite you to bow your heads for a word of prayer. Father God, this is a great privilege for us to be here in your church with your people to consider your word. And my prayer, my earnest prayer, is that your spirit would be here to soften our hearts and to catch our attention that we may see Jesus and fall in love with him anew, afresh, or deeper than we ever have before. Lord, this is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it is that time of the year where we start to look back in review and to see how the year has gone. I don't know what 2018 has been for you, but I'm certain there are some school children here this morning for whom 2018 has been in some sense measured by their report card. Now, I suspect that the latest generation get them online through some portal that comes with school and a password. But back in my day, it was the old folder and the little card that you would slip out, and there your parents would get to read whether you had been naughty or nice. When I would get my report card, I was never embarrassed about the maths grade, but I was always anxious about the English grade. How many of you here this morning would prefer maths over English? Maths? English. Yeah, look, for me, it was cut and dry. If I was to write down a sum on my piece of paper at school, 2 plus 4 equals 6, my maths teacher would tick it and say, 100% correct, well done. But what would happen if the English teacher got hold of that? Well, all of a sudden, I've mixed up the Hindo-Arabic numbering system with Christian symbols of the cross and have failed to give a defense for the juxtaposition of cultural ideas. I'm going to be accused of bias for only using even numbers in my argument and not considering the fact that the odd numbers are being left out. I'm going to lose a mark for not having a full stop. I haven't given a reference, and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking without any due authority. English teachers can make your lives just livid, would you agree? It is much more exciting to live in the realm of the objective. And when you get into the subjective areas like English, well, what's a person going to do? But the strange thing is, as life has continued for me, I have found myself drifting inexorably away from the objectiveness of 2 plus 4 equals 6 to the finer nuances and subjectivity of a world that rarely gives us black and white answers. Are you hearing me, Church of God? The capacity to argue a point of view or to examine an idea or to live in the realm when there is a spectrum of colours and ideologies is perhaps closer to the reality in which we exist than the clear-cut 100% correct or 0% and wrong. Human experience is more than a complex equation or a chemical reaction. Would you agree? 
There are some around today, very smart people, academics who have quite a influence in TED Talks and in, in, in the broader community that would su suggest to us that life is nothing more than a physical reduction of complex chemical reactions. And for them, the idea of morality or conscience or free will or agency, these philosophical terms for them have no meaning. They would want to reduce everything to nothing more than the outcome of complex interactions of brain chemistry and deterministic DNA. But I, along with millions of others, do not find these academics either logical or compelling. For me, I think there exists in human experience existential defence for the fact that life is more than the sum of its parts. There is something about the nature of man that gives us capacity to contemplate the wonder of the idea. And the idea is something that cannot be reduced to a chemical formula or a mathematical algorithm. The idea in itself is something that cannot be measured. You cannot understand the entropy or the quantum of the idea. For a moment, I want to invite you to consider the number 13. Who likes the number 13? We've all got a favourite number. For me, 13 represents the number of years between now and retirement. It's a good number. For others, 13 is an attractive number because it's the first double-digit prime. For others, 13 is associated with superstition and bad luck. And for many people, they don't like 13. But for someone as young as 7 or 8, they can look at this formula on the board. 13 can be represented by 11 plus 2, 12 plus 1. This is a beautiful, simple equation of excellence. It's, it's a neat thing. What if we consider it in English? 11 plus 2 equals 12 plus 1. Is that also mathematically correct? Grammatically correct? Have a look at 11 plus 2. This is actually quite an amazing number. Do you realise that if you rearrange the letters, you get 12 plus 1? This in English is what we call an anagram. 11 plus 2 equals 12 plus 1. Rearrange the letters. 12 plus 1 equals 11 plus 2. Do you like it now more that you know it's an anagram than you did when you just saw it as a sentence? What did we add to the physical substance of the English letters when we infused it with a greater idea than was at first apparent? Would we be able to measure a difference using Avogadro's number and some chemical understanding of the atomic weight of the carbon atoms in the graphite that are sitting there on the page in front of us, to somehow explain how the new idea leapt into our awareness? How can we quantify the idea that 11 plus 2 equals 12 plus 1? I like anagrams, and this morning I want to speak to you of an anagram that specifically relates to Marcel and Larissa and Kirsten and David, but also to all of us. You see, the Bible that I love gives me compelling reason to understand that the Christian's narrative, the Christian's big idea, is that God is the first cause. God is at the beginning of our story. God is the one that gives Christians who believe in the Christian story a framework around which we can make sense of the world in which we live. And in Genesis, we begin the story, in the beginning, God. And in the Gospel of John, which is my favourite of all the Gospels, we find that John picks up this idea and he says, in the beginning was the Word. And what is a word? But a descriptive of a neat concept that gives the idea that there is intentionality in communicating an idea. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning there was communication. In the beginning there was an idea. But the problem was is that that word, that, that idea, that, that, that communication was not in the language which we could understand. 
And so the Gospel of John begins to unpack for us the intentionality of God in saying that I exist in relationship and I want to be in relationship with my creation. And because sin has created barriers to our capacity to communicate openly and, and, and in proximity, I'm going to do something special. And I'm going to take the idea of God and I'm going to incarnate that in human flesh. And I'm going to deposit that human flesh among my people so that they can see and observe and listen and hear and watch and know what I'm like. This Christmas season, as every Christmas season, the world will for a moment pause to, to celebrate a baby. But it, it, it's not so much in the baby as in the man that we see God the most clearly. Would you agree? God has come down here to show us what he is like. And this morning I want to quickly bounce off this anagram, who, how, who, how, who, how. For you see, in the Gospel of John, the great challenge was that when Jesus came down here to show us what he was like, the Bible says the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. But when he came to his own, did his own receive him? The Bible says his own received him not. He was in the world and the world was made by him, but the world knew him not. Jesus came down here to tell us something about God, but because of the cloud and the miasma of, of cultural bias and of, of historical misunderstandings of, and, and, and of the way in which human beings had cluttered around the idea of God, such complexity that God could hardly be seen. Jesus spent most of his life trying to scrape away the barnacles of error so that people could get a clear picture of who he was. And we actually find in the Gospel of John that there is this interaction between the how and the who. Now, for those of you who have visited my place, you know that I've got 10 acres that has got great Alstonville soil and has the potential for growing weeds. And for the past six months, knowing that my beloved daughter would entrust me to create a resemblance of the Garden of Eden, I've been down there with my chainsaw, whippersnipper and roundup. That's how I weed. I know it's not very environmentally friendly, and if you've been on Netflix and you know anything about Big Pharma and the evils of roundup, you can expect me to morph into some kind of, I don't know, alien being with genetic dysfunction any moment now. But I've done my best to turn my backyard into a garden worthy of my daughter and her husband-to-be. And there's a good chance tomorrow that it might rain. And so I have two choices. I can pump my chest up with great determination and resilience and say, I don't care. Or I can crawl up into a fetal position and say, it's the end of the world as we know it. All of my bromeliads and mulching, well, actually, Richard did most of the mulching. Thank you, Richard. Um, all the work that we've put in to make, to make the landscape of the wedding look beautiful might come to naught. And I think to myself of um, this guy here. Does anyone know his name? Salim Mahaja, former mayor of Auburn. Who, who watched the way his wedding went? Larissa, this guy is setting the bar, right? So, um, Marcel, if you haven't been able to deliver for Larissa a Salim Mahaja equivalent, we think you're a small man. Four chartered helicopters land on a field, yeah? Salim and his entourage get out to be greeted by a string of white supercars. Without appropriate council permission, they close off a street in Leedcombe. There are flocks of white doves, there are brass bands, there are kilometres of red carpet. Everything on the internet is true, so when I read that he had 800,000 flowers, I'm going to believe him. But people who get fixated about the how of getting married sometimes find to their horror that it's not the most important thing. And within two years of Salim Mahaja marrying his loved bride Aisha, he was indicted on multiple counts of fraud and tax evasion and corruption 
And um, I'm not sure whether he's spending jail time, but if he's not, he's on appeal of trying to avoid it. The world can get very excited about the how of relationships. Would you agree? When my wife rocks up to Sydney Adventist Hospital sometime back there in September, I think it might have been, or October of 1992, and announced to the world that she was engaged, the first question is, how did he propose? Is that right? Did he get down on the knee? Was there a handcrafted boat involved? Did he take you out to some romantic place and spend lots of money to give you a confidence that he was able to take care of you? What's the most important question? How or who? Does it really matter how you get married? Is it more important who you marry? An economist, I always like people who have mathematical backgrounds that do subjective studies. I feel they've got closer to the truth. So an economist surveyed 3,000 married people in the US and found that there was a lovely inverse proportionality, um, proportionality between the amount spent on the wedding and how long it lasts. Specifically, People who waste money on an engagement ring have the shortest weddings, I mean, the shortest marriages. And those who spend less than $1,000, this is something to be aimed for, Kirsten and Larissa, those who spend less than $1,000 on their weddings have marriages that last the longest. The honeymoon features quite prominently. Those who spend more on the wedding and less on the honeymoon do worse than those who spend more on the honeymoon and less on the wedding. But the thing that caught my attention is that the common factor in the success of the marriage is tied up to a relational metric. Those who marry in community do so much better than those who marry alone. It's almost like this juxtaposition of competing ideas. If you want your children's marriage to be successful, don't spend any money on their wedding, but invite lots of people. So I don't know what's happening on Monday, but if you come on Sunday, we're going to see if we can break the Guinness Book of World Records by cutting a party pie into 132 individual pieces. We want to stick with the figures. We want to go with the numbers. Most of you are aware from what I've been talking about that those in the Newhoff extended family, is, is it Myla, is that the right way to say it, Larissa? It's wrong. Give me, a, give me a better crack at it. Miller? Just normal Miller, but only one L? Oh, look, I did well with the spelling. The Millers and the Newhoffs and the Williams and the Hugheses, especially those who are embarrassed by the lack of Y chromosomes, they have been in a frantic. There has been a hive of activity, and um, I'm sure that if you are going to either Monday or Sunday's wedding, you will be amazed at what um, Marit and, and, and um, Sabrina and um, what Alex and, and Yvette have been able to pull together to make the day of our children's wedding special. That's right, isn't it? it it's what we should do. We want to make this a day they can remember. But at the end of the day, it can rain cats and dogs. We can have thunderstorms, we can lose our marquee, all of our special chairs can get blown over, the chalk can, can run, the, the, the food can go mouldy, the freezer can break, the drinks can be warm. Oh dear, I shouldn't have even imagined it. <laughs> if Kirsten and David and Larissa and Marcel, at the end of the day, are holding hands and going off to enjoy life together, that is what provides meaning to a marriage. Salim Mahaja and, and thousands like him, the Kardashians, I, I don't read enough Who magazines to be able to give you all the statistics, but I'm sure I could look at anybody here and they could give me an example of somebody that spent an inordinate amount on the how of the wedding but had not cemented the who. And their marriages fell apart. 
And for those of you who are completely disinterested in weddings, let's get back to the Word of God because I'm trying to set up a, a preface, an introduction to a concept that I want to leave with you today. John is my favourite gospel, as I explained, and in John we have the unpacking of God's attempt to get to know us, to introduce to us a clear and concise view of who God is. And it's amazing how many times in the gospel of John that the how question comes up. In the first chapter of John, Nathaniel says, how do you know about me? Nicodemus says to Jesus, how are these things you're describing possible? The Samaritan at, 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 uh, um, in the village of Sychar says, how can it be that you, a Jew, talk to me, a woman of Samaria? In John chapter 6, they bring five loaves and two fishes to Jesus and say, how are you going to feed a crowd with this? We could go slowly through the Gospel of John and we could see how many times for human beings the how becomes a barrier to the who. How are we ever going to pull this off? I'm sure Marit and Carl have no idea that Marcel has actually angled himself up down there somewhere in, in Western Sydney and has found himself one of Salim Mahaj's ex-mansions that's been put on Gumtree for a modest sum of 3.5 million. There's a, there's a shack out the back that Charles allowed to live in as long as he promises to mow the lawn. And uh, Marcel's got it all sorted out and, and all, he, all he needs is Marit and Marcel, I mean, and, and Carl to sign guarantor and the house is his. It's, it's a tough gig in Sydney getting a house, Marcel, isn't it? It's a really tough gig. It's actually quite a tough gig getting one in Mwollumbar as well. When you think of these young couples getting married... I lie abed at wake at night for at least 17 seconds before I fall into a deep and profound sleep thinking, how are they going to do it? I've looked after my little girl her whole life. How is this freshly graduated Masters of Education music teacher in Mwollumba going to keep my daughter to the standard of living to which she has grown accustomed? <laughs> this is not the wedding speech, by the way. <laughs> But the how questions become important, don't they? But I'm here to disabuse your mind that the how is really of no relevance if we have cemented the who. Would you agree? If we have made a commitment to each other that we're going to share life's journeys through the good times and the bad, for better or for worse, for in sickness and in health, we have decided that two are going to become one and this marriage is going to work not because we spend the rest of our lives addressing the how, but because we cement, spend the rest of our lives cementing the who. God is relational by nature. And towards the end of John's gospel, when Jesus for three and a half years has been saying to his disciples, this is what God is like, this is what God is like, this is what is God's like. He says, I'm about to go away and I'm about to go and prepare you mansions so that we can be there forever together. And the disciples say to Jesus, we've got no idea what you're talking about. You're here to try and tell us truth and we still haven't caught on. Lord, we don't know where you're going and how do we know the way? And all of the preface and the introduction and the cleverness of my 13 algorithm, which I think is quite good, would you agree? It's a wonderful algorithm, I mean anagram. I love that anagram. Comes down to this point. This is the time where you need to wake up for one minute and listen carefully and then digest the point of this morning's discussion. How do we know the way? How do we know the way? Jesus answers the how question with a who answer. I am the way. If you really want to know the how, know the who. Is that a better anagram than 11 plus 2 equals 12 plus 1? If you really want to know the answers to the how questions, know the who. In Matthew's Gospel, when Jesus finished preaching probably one of the world's greatest ever sermons, he looked his disciples and followers in the eye and said, listen, the Gentiles are obsessed about the how. But seek first the who, and everything else will be taken care of.
Jesus says to his disciples, Have I been with you so long a time and yet you have not come to know me? Our first priority, whether it's in a marriage or in our career or in our spiritual lives, is to become relationally prioritized. Can someone say amen? To become relationally prioritized. Not to obsess about the fine details of how, where, when and why, but to be focused on who. If we value people, we will resonate with God. If we value as our highest priority the connections we have with each other, we will most resonate with the nature of God. And when we know God, when we allow Jesus to disabuse our mind of all of the misconceptions that we have, we will find that we can trust him in every chapter of our lives. He wants to be our confidant. He wants to be our defender. He wants to be our rescuer, our redeemer, our lawyer, our judge, our priest, and our best friend. To the extent that we prioritize intimacy in our marriage, Marcel, Larissa, Kirsten, David, prioritize intimacy. Not just physical intimacy, but emotional intimacy. Connection. Two of you becoming one. Church of God, unless we prioritize intimacy, not just proximate connection with the physical body of Christ, but that intimacy that happens when two minds resonate as one, then our spirituality will be less than it could be. Larissa, I asked you to do a scripture reading and you might have thought you got away with it. I'm going to let you get away with it. Is that all right? Can I do it for you? I can do it for you. John goes through his gospel with complaints of God, how, 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 and he gets to the end and he says, who, who, who? I am the way, the truth and the life. And this is eternal life. Not that you can explain all of life's mysteries. Not that you can quantify everything that needs to be measured. Not that you can answer every conundrum or riddle. But that you are connected with the God who is the answer and who has the answers. This is eternal life. To know God and to know Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. Church of God, my challenge to you today is simple. Let us not be so much troubled about the hows of this life until we have nailed down its who's. This is a truth, not just for those embarking on marriage, but for all of us who would enjoy eternal life. Father God, this church is a repository of people in it who are broken, whose lives are complex and complicated many for whom the future seems dark and foreboding. And Lord, while we do not have an answer to all of the how questions, may we have it settled forever, that if we have you, we have more than enough and everything we need.